first webinar, cutting my teeth. Um, okay, so I just want to be able to welcome everybody um, to the webinar. I know that we have some folks that are coming up. I'm going to be sharing my screen in a minute because we have um, live captioning. I'm going to go ahead and do that now. This part to be bigger. This car to be bigger. <laughs> no, what's the part I want to be bigger? Okay, well, as I'm figuring that out, um, we we're able to get a live captioning service. So we want to make this as accessible to people as possible. Um, and I just want to go over a couple of ground rules. We're, there's a link in the chat that um, gives folks uh, just kind of a flow chart of how we want to ask questions, um, to think about your questions before you ask them. That was developed by Eve Tucker. Danny Terrell at CD Forum also uses that. Um, that flow chart when, when doing talkbacks um, at different sessions. So please take a look at that. But if you have questions, I'm gonna ask you that you put the questions um, in the Q&A box um, and we will, uh, Sharon will be um, moderating the panel. So she'll be able to look at those questions and take those as we go. Um, so I, I first just wanna open it up. Uh, my name is Alina Santian. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. I'm the Director of Racial Equity for the Seattle Center Cohort, and uh, we open all of our meetings with a land acknowledgement, so I just want to take this time to acknowledge that we live, work, and play on the unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, specifically the Duwamish, and that we occupy this land. This acknowledgement does not take the place of building authentic relationships with Native and Indigenous communities, but serves as a first step in honoring the land that we occupy um, and also in a step of resisting the erasure of Native and Indigenous peoples. So I want to just raise my hands in honor to, to the first people um, here, and we're going to get started. So I'm, I'm super excited for this conversation. I'm very grateful for the panelists who've been willing to, uh, to share um, their time and their, their, uh, their lived experience and their wisdom and brilliance with us. Um, so I, I want to just take a minute to, to introduce them, and then I will pass it off to our facilitator. So we have the wonderful Leisure Fair, um, first Seattle Poet Laureate in Seattle, Youth Laureate, right? What's up? Yes. Yes. Um, Jace, Jace from Black Stacks. Um, he's been a, a good friend for a long time. I'm excited to, uh, to have him here. We have Na, if you have not seen Na's work, Shame on you. You need to make sure that you see, um, see Na's work. And I'm excited to have, um, to have Na here and Leisha and Jace and the wonderful, my good friend, Ms. Sharon Nairi Williams. Um, even if I could have facilitated this conversation between the two of us, I would have stepped back anyway. Sharon is an amazing facilitator, an amazing artist herself. So I'm excited to, um, here with the conversation, how it goes. So I'm going to go ahead and um, bounce over here and pass it on to Sharon. Thank you, Alina, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. Um, thank you to our panel. Um, I love these people, so we're going to um, do our best to have a great conversation. And like Alina mentioned, please use the Q&A box, and we will try to address those as we go. We don't have a lot of time. Um, well, um, so let's go ahead and get those questions. Well, uh, I think we had a pause for the calls. Oh, what happened? Sharon, Sharon paused for a minute. Okay, there she goes. Oh. Am I back? Cool. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thanks for letting me know. I was just talking like, what's going on? Um, so um, if this is a safe space to have a conversation and to ask the questions um, that sometimes you may not be, um, you may not feel comfortable asking, um, but we're going to take it in stride and we all know why we're here to 
to help people move forward and create change within their organizations. Um, so please don't hesitate to ask something, um, even if you feel that it might be a little bit uncomfortable. Um, we will let you know um, if we don't want to answer it. We are all strong enough people to say, nah, you might want to go do some research yourself on that. So um, let's keep it real. So yeah, let's just jump right in. I um, one thing I want to do is because sometimes we think that we are different from everyone, um, that we don't have any commonalities. So let's start with what's your favorite song? Mm. You know what 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 song are you listening to right now? Um, uh, we'll start with Jace because <laughs> you're the musical one in the group. That's what's up. <laughs> Okay, I don't have a problem with that. Well, welcome. Thank you, everybody, for having us. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for uh, facilitating this conversation, Sharon. Uh, I know you'll keep it real and honest. And so I also want to say thank you to Alina for inviting me to this conversation because I think it's important. Uh, as far as music, I'm really in the black stacks right now. So we have a new song coming out called The River. Uh, it speaks to a lot of spirituality a lot of vibration, a lot of things that are happening in the world, but that happen every day. And so it's just not necessarily a reaction to what's going on, but it's being proactive to making sure that we stay tapped into our soul, our spirit, and our, our connection to one another moving through these times, which are very difficult. So I'm going to be a little braggadocious, but right now I'm listening to a song called River by Black Stacks. <laughs> nice. That's what's up. Uh, nah. Yes. Um, for me, I'll, I'll be honest. What what I just listened to last night was uh, Beyonce, Black is King. Mm -hmm. So um, I and the reason why I think for me, it's just getting a chance to like listen to or watch uh, videos of, of young black and brown skinned girls sing that brown skin girl song i've gotten a chance to see folks that um you know have young daughters black daughters singing that song and, I, and i'm like that's so beautiful that i get a chance to see a song that is totally focused on them and that they can sing along so um yeah that's what i've been listening to that's awesome Lasia. Currently, um, I don't know if you guys know Freddie Gibbs. He's a rapper from Indiana. I've been listening to his new album called Alfredo. Um, and he has a song called God is Perfect. That is like my jam right now. Um, so I would say that's my favorite song right now. Cool. And for me, it's um, William Beckton. It's, uh, I'm here with my father supporting him because he just lost his wife. And one of the songs that um, we played during the service was Be Encouraged by William Beckton and um, and it really has um, really helped in moving through this time, um, not just with the passing of his wife, but also um, just the state of what our community and the world is in right now with the social unrest and the pandemic. So thank you all for sharing that. Um, uh, that's now let's now let's get to it. Let's let's get down. So you know, when this, when everything first started happening, um, a lot of organizations sent out emails saying, um, we stand with you, Black Lives Matter. And um, so we, we repeatedly saw email after email after email. What does it do for you? Or how does it make you feel when you hear someone say um, they stand with the Black community? And we'll start with um, Lasia. All right, so I know that the title of this is all performative uh, allyship. And when I think of allyship, I, I think a lot of people identify it as an identity when that's not, that shouldn't be the case in your allyship. Your, your allyship should be a lifelong process. Um, it should be you being a forever student. And I think during these times, people are using um, ally to be their identity because it means so much to the their um, business and making money and I think that that's where they fall short so in my opinion I feel like a lot of times when they do that it doesn't come across genuine 
uh, when you come from the approach of being a student and actually wanting to learn and unlearn things, I think that's when it actually um, implements change. Thank you. Jace. Wow, okay. That was, that was, that was right on time for me. I, you know, a lot of times I always think about people who right now are screaming Black Lives Matter, but they, they really don't get at us. You know, I can walk down the street and people are screaming Black Lives Matter, but they won't speak to me. And so I, I've always come to this conclusion that, you know, you can't speak for me if you won't even speak to me. You know, there's a lot of organizations that have systematic um, unequality in their, in their, in their built-in um, organizational structure. And so when you look at it, it's like, yeah, you can send out a letter and yeah, every like, Lejah was saying everybody wants to make money and seem like they are also conscious. But let's go look at your policies. Let's not look at the people. Let's look at the policies. Let's look at the things that you've done prior to this. And let's look at the things that you will do after this. And so just because awareness is here, it doesn't automatically give you access to us. It doesn't automatically give you access to our fight, to our struggle, to our pain. And so, you know, I'm looking at organizations for not what they say, but what they do. I like to say it's not in your rhetoric, it's in your routine. So what is it that you're doing that's making the change as opposed to what are you saying? Because you can say anything, but the actions you take really prove uh, the movement that you're really a part of. And if you're a part of this movement, then like Leisha said, you need to sit back, learn a little bit, and not come in trying to direct, be a director of what it is that we're going through as a people, as Black people in America. Thank you. Thank you. Um, nah. I mean, going after them. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, 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 I chime in and say, and, and ring the bell saying yes to, to, to what, you know, Lasia and Jace have, um, said, because, um, I was not in my head hard when, when you said, uh, I see people yelling out Black Lives Matter, but they're not speaking to me. And I mean, we got masks on. I can still hear you. So, right. um, right. so with, with me, I, I think time is everything. And I think time and trends are everything. I, I don't want this to be a trend because it easily, it can easily be a trend. I mean, if you really think about it, if you look outside and you see how, how, what it looked like before in the beginning of the protest to what it looks like now, mm -hmm. it's a, it's regular quote unquote, it just feels regular. So if it feels regular on a day to day basis outside walking on the street, except for, you know, the overall is not regular, but what you can see from the process to now is, is it going to be the same thing in organizations where the letter was being shown and sent out to, because if you're an org and you see another org doing it and you're not, and you're not doing, and you're not sending out those letters. Now you look bad. So you like, listen, just like type this up real quick. Cause we got to make sure that, you know, the black community knows that we're on their side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it's the same thing it's that whole thing about okay after that email is sent after after 2020 mm -hmm. what's going to happen can I still look back and say even in 2023 like yo what happened in 2020 they were actually consciously really working on what they were saying when the heightened Black Lives Movement happened. Mm -hmm. they, they kept the steady trail mm -hmm. because it is a trail. I'm Black 24-7. Right. <laughs> I have no choice but to, but to continue this trail. Like, my ancestors are, are like, you need to continue. Mm -hmm. you, can't, you, you can't give up. And I'm like, and, and no, this is not your ancestry, but we're all here on this earth. Mm -hmm. We are all here on this earth. Org, when you step out of your, your office and you, and you put your, your briefcase away and you go into the light rail or you go inside your car, you are still 
committed to this process. When you go home with your family, you are still committed to this process. It doesn't happen when you sit down in the office with the group of people that you're working with. It just doesn't end there after the meeting is done. It doesn't end there after the email. It is a continuous process. And you have to really sit down with yourself as an individual. Forget the org right now. As an individual within the org, you actually have to sit down with yourself and say to yourself, do I really want to do this work? Mm -hmm. Do I really want to do this work? Mm -hmm. And then go in, because if you have a personal and an and a personal feeling of saying to yourself, like, yes, I actually want to do this work. It's, it will show in the org mm -hmm. because you're part of it and you want to be part of this community and you want to show and you want to show out and you want to connect with, with the black community. If you don't want to do that, honestly, don't say it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Come on. Come on. Yeah. I'm, yeah, that is so true. People often forget that, um, especially in running a black organization, right? It's not, it's not something I do, it's something I live. It's okay. something to where um, we're uplifting black people all the time because we are black and that's what we do. None of us would have said okay to this conversation or being a part of this conversation if we didn't have a relationship with Alina, right? Alina has, I, I know I've, I, I've known Alina for a few years now, and it's been the same thing. It's in her, their bones. And so how, how do we, how does an organization who is not in their bones, right? How do they, or what would you recommend for them to do in building a relationship? Mm -hmm. And I mean, beyond the, oh, we're about to do this Black event, or we're about to have this Black show, or we're about to really push funders your way because you're black and we love what you're doing. How do we build relationships? Jace? Wow, that's a, that's a really great question. But I like what Na was saying. If it's not, you know, if it's not in you and it's on you, then take those clothes off and put some other clothes on because we're seeing through all that nonsense and, 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 and unauthenticity that you're trying to do. So, I, I you know, it's, it's a difficult question to me because sometimes I'm like, if it's not in them, then why are we trying to force them? Why are we trying to force them to be a part of something that is not who they are? It's not what they represent. And do we really want people using the term black just to make it seem like they care when we really know it's performative? It's all performative. It's only for the show. It's only for people who are for the likes. It's only for people to say, oh, look at them. They're down with us as opposed to having conversations like these from artists, from black folks who walk around black every day, 24-7, 365, sometimes 366, who live this every day, who talk about this, who are talking about the beauty of themselves prior to the, the uprising of the movement of black lives, something that we've been talking about since we've been here. And so I, I, I sometimes struggle with the fact of even trying to get these organizations to really be a part of something that benefits them in the long run, that humanity that we talk about, um, if that's not who they are. Maybe we should allow them to be exactly who they are. Hey, we don't need you to do a black concert. We don't need you to do a black conversation. We don't need you because we have these every day. We live this every day. So we're not worried about if you tap in or not. We understand the uniqueness of us, the the value of us, the the the, the creativity that comes from us, the, the love, the spiritual. We understand all of that. And so when, when you talk about that, I always look at it like family, right? Like I'm not gonna bring somebody into my house that I know doesn't love my love my family. That I know is there only to try to figure out a way to manipulate my family. So I'm not gonna bring anybody into something black just because right now in 2020, like Nas said, in 2020, we're talking about this, but in 2021, we're acting like this never happened. Like we've, we've, we've made it and we haven't made it. And so uh, I just struggle with that question. You know, I think an ally is somebody who puts themselves out there to work with you, um, to understand where you're coming from, to listen to you, to, to speak 
in how you would want to be spoken for and not going in with their agenda. We have to watch that. that some people are tapping in only because they're promoting agendas. Like we're promoting survival, life, freedom, humanity, respect, dignity, value for black people all across the globe. And if we got to start here to do it, then we'll start here to do it. So I struggle with that. And luckily, I work with an organization that we address that same question. Are we just putting out statements to say we care? Or are we actually putting out actions that reflect we care? And I think that matters more than the talk that's being spoken sometimes. Yeah, a lot of what I'm hearing right now is it's all about the why. Why are you doing what you're doing? Are, are you doing it just for the, for the moment or are you doing it truly to help change America and make this place better um, and give black people the respect that's due and, and the homage that's due? Lasia, for you, um, going in as an artist to any organization, can, can you talk about a time when you went into a white organization and you felt comfortable? You felt like, I, I can do this. I don't feel, I feel like I can be my, and some people already have the strength to walk into any space and feel like they can be their 100% self. But when you hit that stage and you see a predominantly white audience, how do you handle that? And what, what makes you feel as comfortable as you can be in that situation? Mm, that's a good question. I think I, there hasn't been a time where I fully felt comfortable in those situations. I think always in the back of my head, I'm always like, oh, these people, they're going to think I'm radical. They're going to think I'm, you know, they're going to have all these different terms for me. Um, so even in the back of my head, I'm always thinking about my poetry because I'm very black and my poetry promotes blackness. So I know that there's going to be those disguised uh, progressive Seattleites, you know, that disguise themselves as these progressive people, but really they're very racist. Um, and I always know that's going to exist. But back to um, kind of what my dad was saying, I, it's about nurturing relationships. And I think it comes from the businesses. They have to be willing to nurture the relationship between me being the artist and them. Um, I immediately thought about like the cop community dynamic and how um, cops don't create safe neighborhoods. It's more the resources that create safe neighborhoods. And so if they're not willing to give resources that make artists feel comfortable, then there's never going to be that, that nurtured relationship that's happening. So I've never genuinely completely felt that. Um, I think how I deal with that is knowing where I come from, knowing that I come from a Black Panther bloodline and tying back to that um, and realizing that every, every time somebody presents themselves a certain way doesn't mean that that's their true um, feelings, especially in Seattle. So. Mm -hmm, definitely. It took me, um, it took me into knowing, um, being an a intern at the Seattle Repertory Theater and working on shows there, I didn't, I didn't feel the importance of having people that look like me doing what I wanted to do um, on stage and behind the scenes was important until the August Wilson play came in. And I was excited every day about going to work at the theater, but I was even more excited. I felt more excited and more involved when August Wilson play was in the building because you had actors and you had people behind the scenes and production doing the thing. And when they left the building, I felt lost. And I was like, what's going on with me? But that importance of not just presenting and bringing in one person or one person here, but seeing the whole spectrum of we, we as Black people can do all jobs, but people tend to not hire us for those jobs because, to be all honesty, jobs are basically a friend to a friend, right, the majority of the time. Let me tell my network, you tell your network, if you don't have any Black person in your network, then they're not going to hear about it. Um, so we have a question now uh, from, and I, I apologize if I'm saying your name wrong, Kan Kan Kanani. And they ask, in our org, we're always stuck on basic anti-racist education to get a shared foundation. It's important, but I'm also ready to move on to action instead of talking. Any recommendations for making that transition? Um, nah, any thoughts? Um, I think that's the, that's the main thing that we have been talking about. Like, what does it look like to 
stop the converse, just the conversation piece and actually have the action. Um, and I guess I'm, I know maybe part of it is like, it's easier than it looks, but I think if you are writing down three things, are these are the three main things that we need to do and just set them in action. And I mean, I'm, I'm the artist. <laughs> I'm the artist that, that, that's coming to the org. But if there's a startup of those three things, if everyone can agree, and, and, and that's the thing. Another thing is the whole thing about agreement of people saying like, okay, I feel like this is worth it. I feel like this is worth doing. But if everyone can come to agreement and say, all right, we're going to do this thing. We're going to do that thing. And we're going to do this thing. And these are the top three things that we are going to work towards. We can't probably do the whole list of 10, but if we can do those three and start with those three, then we are actually driving someplace instead of just parked. What are those things? I'm thinking. <laughs> um, honestly, I feel like maybe one of those things are actually calling the, everybody to the table. Does everybody know each other? And in the sense, and what I mean by that, I'm thinking, okay, the main constituents that are part of this group for um, anti-racist and, uh, you know, yeah, anti-racist, um, making sure that things are, are for equal rights within their org, bringing the artists in. I think even just having like a, a communal artists get together with people from the board and it, if it's not everybody fine but some of the people from the board and the artists like I think that's one thing we are so separate from each other and we don't know who's who and then we have these people who are making decisions and until something you know the 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 catchy phrase pops off until something goes wrong then it's just like oh okay, let's, let's kind of calm down being behind the scenes and actually step up and say like, hey, you are the artist, I see you, and I am part of the board. And what does that conversation look like? Because every org to every artist is different, but also they hold a commonality. Mm -hmm. What are those needs? Mm -hmm. Maybe asking what are the needs from your from your people from the people that you are working with who what do they need what do they need <laughs> i feel like honestly that's probably the, the best thing i could say what do they need instead of trying to figure out or assume what people need ask them what they need can i chime in can i chime in with that because i think that's very important of course Jay. a lot of people tap right they come right in and they're like okay i'm gonna give you this this or this we didn't ask you for that. We didn't tell you we needed that. So what made you assume we needed that? Is this your, is this your, your prejudice about what you think it is that we need as black artists in Seattle? You know, and the other thing about it for me is, you know, now I hit on something, it really, it really touched me. Do we even come together as black artists in Seattle and have the conversation with one another? Or are we clicked up too? Are we so clicked up that we're like, oh, man, I don't mess with nah, nah, I don't mess with Jace. Jace, oh, man, well, I got to mess with Lazy, right? That's my daughter, right? Yeah. Jace don't mess with Sharon. Sharon don't mess with Lazy. And then we throw events, and we're like, we're looking, at, we're looking at the turnout. We're looking at the vibration that comes from it. You know, my partner, Felicia Loud, always talks about it being vibrational, it being something you can feel even if you can't see it. Mm -hmm. I would love to see right now. I would love to see right now that black artists that identify as black come together and we start to talk about what we need, what do we want, how do we want to be valued in this, in this space, in this city, on this earth, how do we see ourselves, not only what are we getting, but what are we giving, right? How dope would it be if not put on an event and we all showed up, like literally all showed up, or CD Forum, Sharon puts on an event. And we all show up, even if we don't stay, but we all show up, we all contribute. 
Do we know what kind of power, what kind of message that sends to the rest of the world, particularly in a city like Seattle? We just show up, right? We should, Asia has an event. We show up, Black Stat, we show up. Mm-hmm. Right. And not only do we show up, if there's something that we see or there's something there that we feel can be built on, we share it with one another. We don't keep it in and go, OK, when I do my show, I'm going to do it like this. Go tell the organizers of the event. Go tell those artists of the, at the event. Hey, let me let me give you a little insight of what I saw, mm-hmm. because every experience is ours. And so if we share it to each one, teach one, if we share it, then the next person has the ability to evolve and elevate. We as black artists in Seattle need to start understanding that us coming together is the most powerful, not just in performative ways, but in ways that are going to be beneficial moving forward and showcase Mm -hmm. not just our talents, but showcase what unity really looks like. Yeah. Get back to Black Festival, 10,000 black folks showing up for each other every month. There, there's there's definitely layers to everything, right? There's like, um, there, there's layers. It's like, we need to come together. And also, why can't these organizations create that space versus that transactional space, right? So the more, majority of time when you work for a theater, they will bring in a black cast but then, like now, we're saying it would be like uh, the 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 organization will come and meet the cast, but the ca- cast has to do something, right? Versus just everybody sitting around the table having lunch or having breakfast, having a conversation, getting to know one another, and sometimes it's that simple, right? Um, that the board member knows the artist or the, uh, the executive director or the managing director or the program person knows the artist, knows, knows what they like, what they don't like because they had a genuine conversation without the artist having to put out. It's like, we always want the artist to put out. We, we can't invite them to anything unless they put out. Um, so how do we prevent that from happening? And so, um, so my thing, my question for you, Lasia, is this, and, we're, we're, and thank you for everyone who's putting questions in the box. We'll get to those as well. But my question is, are, are organizations and people just making it so hard when they say, well, what do we do? <laughs> for sure. I think that that's a very broad statement. I was thinking about what the person was saying and, and expounding on that, that um, outreach for help. I think that it's important that these businesses or these organizations also have terms of access. Um, what parts of the artists that the artists are willing, uh, willing for the organizations to access? Because when you think of black art or any type of uh, person of color art, it's very, it's a revolutionary act in, in and of itself. And so there's parts of it that we're not willing to give. There's parts of it that are very, you know, um, close to us. And, as a cultural thing. And so I think a lot of times they invade those terms of access. So having a set term of access and how you're willing to infiltrate, how you're willing to um, um, be a part of a culture is important. And I think that that's a conversation that needs to happen with artists. What access access am I willing to give to you? Um, what access do I not want you to kind of invade? I think that's uh, an important step for them to take. Thank you, Leisha. We have a a question here from Anonymous. A lot of arts organizations are struggling with funding right now, meaning layoffs and other budget cuts that affect employee livelihood. As we know, BIPOC are usually the ones who get unfairly disadvantaged in times of hardship. Should arts org CEOs and other executives take pay cuts in order to keep BIPOC people on staff or to keep resources available for BIPOC employees? Mm. Anybody want to take that? Hmm. You know, I feel like in this time, I can say in this time, just overall, um, talking to my, my mother and my father and them telling me we've never seen something like this in a sense of the pandemic, right? And there are 
a lot of questions and a lot of decisions that are being made that probably none of us, and I'm talking about the human race, thought we would have to make decisions for. Um, and I know there are people who have lived their life in a certain type of way and are not ready to give that up. And I know there are people who have no choice but to live their life in a different type of way because they have no choice but to do that because of the situation that they're in. So when it comes down to it, it I, feel, I feel when I look at things, it is always... It is something that becomes personal and individualistic and then becomes communal. And the question is to, to, those, to those folks who, who the executives and in, in, in the orgs, are you willing to do that? Are you actually willing to do that? Because, I mean, if you've looked at the stats, and, and all of these things, when it talks about um, BIPOC community, what, what we are going through as, as a people, if this wasn't happening, would you take a cut? <laughs> you, you, you know what I'm saying? Like, so for me to say yes, they need to, or for me to say no, they don't, it, or maybe it's, it honestly, it's just like, we have the facts and the stats already. If mm -hmm. you are looking into the facts, the factual information and the stats of our community and for, and for people who are working within your organization, the question is actually on those executives if they feel like this is something that they should do. Mm -hmm. I, like so I and for me I'm not going to say yes or no I'm going to say it is on that per it's on that person it's on that executive it's on that org if they feel that this is if they feel like it's necessary mm -hmm. I know it's necessary I know you know making sure that the person that works for you that is of um that that is BIPOC can actually put food on their table and feed themselves and feed their family. Yes, that's necessary. That's necessary for anybody to make sure they got food on the table. Will you take that cut to make sure that the other person has food on the table? Hmm. Question. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Now that's great. And my, my, my thing with this question too, is that if, if you have so few BIPOC staff members, that you have to even ask yourself that question, then you have a bigger problem in your organization. Um, and so, so, and at the same time, and with that, arts orgs, um, from, from the arts organizations I know, um, executive directors aren't making millions. Um, and so th they're barely making it. So the question is, I don't, I don't think, I don't think this sector, unless you have a high-end organization and you're living well beyond your means, that that becomes a question. I think um, because, because we all want to make, the problem with the arts industry already is that we're not making what we're worth. Um, and so, but if you're a CEO of a Amazon or a Microsoft and you're making millions, yeah, you can afford to to not take a salary because you, you, you got reserves, but a lot of arts org C executive directors don't have reserves because mm -hmm. we're not making what we're worth. But again, if you're asking that question, there's something, um, there's too few BIPOC members in your, in your, um, on your staff. Um, another also, question. Also, if I can, like, we also got to let people understand, like we, we have what we need to take care of one another. We really do. But it's a matter of, it's like I said, what, what do you want to do? Like, we don't know what you do when you leave the office. We don't know what your family dynamic is all the time. But when that, that 
Artist Relief Fund was started by E.G. Ome, and it showed that we really could you, you go use the people and the people could support. I think that spoke so much. So it was huge because it let people know, hold on. We all don't have to run to the arts organizations and try to all just, you know, hey, we need this, we need this, we need this. We can say we're doing this. Now, if you want to join us, great. And this is what we expect from you. So I think we should come from a place of strength as opposed to a straight, a place of with our hand out. That's just all I wanted to say on that. Definitely. Um, definitely. Uh, question from Anonymous. How can we help allies know that although we want them to listen to our personal experiences, it's draining when they ask us questions that, it, that they could Google. For example, essentially, what is the most productive way for allies to learn? That's not going to drain marginalized communities. Laser? That's a loaded question. Uh, like I said earlier, there's a lot of performance that's happening right now during this pandemic. There's a lot of performative allyship. There's a lot of performative activism. And it starts with how you acknowledge it being either an identity or if you're being a student to this. I think a lot of allies come from a from, come from a form of being the gurus and having all the knowledge um, and also draining people of that knowledge. So yes, one tool I think is to look on the internet. Um, we are humans and we can't always be drained of emotions. We can't always be drained of resources. Um, so it's important that you go out and seek that knowledge yourself. Um, I also think that it's important that you're actually in the communities that you're looking to learn more about. If you're going from a, you know, a bird's eye view and trying to gain information from these communities, it's never going to work. Um, that's why it doesn't work with a lot of, you know, CEOs and uh, different businesses that are very high up because they're going from a bird's eye view. So I think you need to take a second to also unlearn, like I said earlier. There's a lot of unlearning that's not happening. And in order for this system that's currently in place, this ecosystem that is so hard to uh, infiltrate and be broken, we have to be willing to unlearn um, to reduce the strength of the system. So I think those are like some of the important things that need to be happening. And, and, and that's perfect for, to let everyone know that it is Black August. And Black August is, um, if you don't know, Google it. Um, and, but don't, but don't start to treat it. Once you learn what it is, don't start to treat it like black history month and commercialize it. Um, the thing around black August is doing the research and learning about the revolutionaries and organizations and things of that nature. And so do the work, um, just, just do the work. Even at these, uh, like these black lives matter protests, I see a lot on the news. They'll have, um, um, allies be in the front of the crowd or allies that are spray painting Black Lives Matter on these buildings and it's like nobody asks you to do that you know you're not helping the cause if you know if you want to be of help you know you can provide resources whether it be water uh, whether it be uh, protection um, but you using your your allyship to further a message about Black Lives Matter that it's destructive that it's um you know, that there's looters, it's not doing anything for us. So you really need to be asking the people first and foremost, what can I do at these protests to be helpful? Um, I think that's the most important thing. Thank you. Um, what are your suggestions for expanding our personal social networks to include more BIPOC individuals to help grow diversity in our org, especially in COVID times when we are un unable to explore new spaces? Do you have general hesitations when a white person tries to befriend you? What are they? Jace? I was waiting for nah. I'm okay. <laughs> Go ahead and break them down, you know? <laughs> so much knowledge, you know, when, you know, when black women, you know, how you identify, I don't know, but when black women are speaking, they speak so powerful. And for me, you know, I don't know necessarily how to answer that because I don't go out looking for white friends, right? I go out looking for people with high high character. Mm -hmm. I always teach my daughters, you know, you, you base people on the content of the character, not the color of their skin. Love yourself, love your people, love your family. But when you're out in the world, you base people off the content of their character. 
And so, you know, that's a that's a question for me. I don't really know if I'm the one to answer that because I don't go out of my way and go, okay, let me go find some white friends and make sure that I'm included in their conversations. I go find people who are quality people. And if they happen to be white people, then so be it. If they happen to be black folks, I love it. If they happen to be brown folks, I love it. You know, but I want to talk to people who aren't just, I'm not their, I'm not their showcase. They can't say, Jace, come through and look at my black friend. Look at this big six foot three black man. Look, I told you I'm not scared of black people. Like, I don't want to be that. So mm -hmm. I don't really know. I think when you do something from, from a, a, a generic, authentic place, then you get that back. I believe what you put out always comes back. I'm a spiritual person as well. So, you know, that's why I said I was waiting for Nah because maybe there's something Nah's going to say that, you know, spark something for me. But, you know, when I, when I think about just going out and being like, okay, let me make sure that, you know, um, I can be approached. It goes back to my original statement. I don't want you screaming Black Lives Matter when you can't get at us, when you can't even speak to me. So I'm your black friend, but, you know, I'm just the, the trophy. I'm just the showcase for you. So I think, you know, if you really have a genuine respect for the people you're trying to befriend, then I think you go in with the humbleness and dig give them the their dignity and value like you do when you create any other friendships. Mm -hmm. And don't do it just so that you can showcase and that they be that that one um that one black friend that gives you the access to all black people. Like that's not even the answer either. You know, I've I've seen people say, you know, I got black friends, so I could say the N word. Really? Your black your white your black friend's gonna get you hurt in the wrong situation, or excuse me, the right situation. So I think, you know, it's the content of the character, it's what you represent, what, what comes off um, when, you're, when you're in the room with people and your genuineness to really value that friendship and value that person and not just use them as a trophy. Yo, I think you answered that question perfectly. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> I mean... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you answered that question perfectly. Thank you. Um, just for the audience sake and for the panelists as well, we're at 351. I mean, not 351. I'm on the East Coast. Uh, 1251. <laughs> and, uh, and so we're going to get to the rest of these questions, but I just want you to know that we may go a little over, um, but um, it is being recorded so that you won't miss anything. Um, but I'll, uh, so let's get to the next question. Thanks. Um, so much that I value about relationship and conversation, especially from a theater artist's point of view, um, shows up in actually gathering face to face. Any thoughts about taking those action steps of relationship and conversation in this time of pandemic where we aren't able to gather? Nah? Yeah, I get, I get speak on that. Um, the reality is right. We are not able to gather. We can't gather over 10 people or, or, you know, that, that's just, that's, that's for safety because we all want to live. Um, who are the people that you already know? Who are the people that before this pandemic happened that you already knew of? And that you knew either that person and you knew that this other person was connected to that person. How do you get in contact with them? Do you do it through email? Do you do, do it through Instagram? Do you do, do you do it through Facebook? Do you have their phone number? We are living in such a technological world. I mean, to the extent that we don't even know. There's more technology that is out there that we have not even touched yet. So there are so many different ways to get in contact with folks, with that one person that you know. And if, like Jay said, if you come with that dignity and that honor and respect that you would with any type of friendship or any type of connection or relationship or business relationship that you would do with anybody else, if you come with that one person and that one person sees that, that one person is just like, okay, this is actually a genuine conversation. You know, well, what else is your intentions in the midst of this 
of, of this connection that we are making and come off honest. Well, these are my intentions. And if, and if that person knows that, then it's just like, okay, now we can work towards this and I can connect you with this person and I can connect you with that person. And then we can actually make an actual community mm-hmm. through what we're doing right now. This is a panel discussion that usually people would have to come like, all right, let me make sure I'm on time. Let me sit down. Let me quiet my phone, turn my, vibrate my phone and all this other stuff. But we're doing this and you're actually being able to ask us questions from all of us being on different places of the states in our homes. Mm -hmm. So the fact that we can do this is the fact that you can do that. Mm -hmm. All you got to do is find one person one person that you didn't pay attention to when you was at work, one person that you just said probably hi to but didn't really make any f- full connection with. You know, when I think about this quarantine, it, uh, so many people have so many um, perspectives about it. But the, the, the horrific and, and, and death toll that, has, that, has, that we've had to see also lets us know that we, our, ti- our, our time here is sensitive. Mm-hmm. So if our time here is sensitive, if we're not thinking about our mortality and the time that we have here on this earth, what, what are you going to do that is productive with your time? And if you are asking that question and making relationships so you can see what it's going to look past this, start with one person. We can't see 10 people right now. So just start with that one person Mm -hmm. and see if that person is willing to connect with you. And and then if that person is not willing to connect with you, why? Mm -hmm. What did you do? Mm -hmm. What was, the, what was the connection that just didn't, that veered off? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, commit to connecting back to that and seeing what, what that is in that relationship. And then now seeing like, oh, and even if you didn't do something wrong, find out what their assumption is about, uh, about the connection. You know what I'm saying? But you it's it's honestly having to 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 step out like a little kid in kindergarten and say hi to the to the person mm-hmm. hi what's your name mm. back like the children mm. can teach us children. <laughs> like the babies every day that's right that's all you gotta right. do is just message that person and say hi how are you i know <laughs> excuse my way i know stuff is crazy out here <laughs> And I, and I know that there's a lot going on and I just want to reach out. Genuine humani- humanity contact is, that's it. I know I'm talking too much, but go ahead. <laughs> nah, yo, that's good stuff. I mean, because it, it's, it's like, it, it's not that complicated. It's not. It's, it's um, at a time where everybody wants you to reach out. I mean, we're all communicating via technology. And so it may be some of the easiest time to say, hey, I've seen your work. Um, I, I like you or I've heard of you in the community. How do I reach out to you? But stop. I need, I need people in Seattle to stop saying, yo, you're so dope. Yo, your work is so fly. You'd be like, you ain't never came to my show. Right. I, I know my audience. Right. I, I have a relationship with my audience. I know you ain't never been to my show. Mm. do the research take the time um and we have the time. Creative with with your networking right now like you guys were saying like during this pandemic it's kind of forcing us to reevaluate our relationship with time that's why i like that Nob brought, brought up time so you have to kind of readapt your social settings now it's not you know town hall now it's not different um langston he's performing arts center now it's mm-hmm. instagram now it's zoom so you have to be willing to kind of redefine how you're using these social settings and how you want to reach out to people. You can, it can be done. You know, obviously I'm getting used to zoom in this different technology. So it's a, it's a curve that you're going to have to get through, but it can be done. Oh, and you, you. Like my man, Amir, Amir would say, you know, your network is your net worth. You know, right now go find some new artists you haven't heard of before. 
Go go Google some new artists in the town that you haven't heard of. Go to make sure you go and support these artist shows. Mm -hmm. You know, donate to them a dollar, five dollars. It means a lot. It helps them continue their art. So now you can still you can get this information that's needed for you moving forward. Mm -hmm. you know, the biggest, you know, the biggest uh, 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 Nikita Oliver said this one time, she was like, you know, when, when revolution starts and she heard it from, I forgot where she got it, but she said, when revolution starts, they try to kill the artist because it cuts off the voice. It cuts off what the people are saying, what they're seeing, what they're feeling. We do it through visual, through spoken word, through music, you know, through our style. We do it in so many ways. And so it's so important that right now, don't get out of your click in this town, get out of your click. Then go find some of these black artists that are doing some really dope work and go support them. Support them. It's very important. So we can continue to share with the world our story, our, our narrative. And the narrative don't get changed because this is our narrative. We have a right to share it the way we want to. And we have many different facets through the art that we share. It. So, so go out and start supporting artists that you know you heard of. Might not have never been to the concert, like Sharon said. You talking all this, but you ain't never been to a show. <laughs> you won't even come drop a dollar on a brother a sister. You won't even come drop a you're nothing on us, but you wants to give you everything. Like, come on now. Fair exchange, we, we operate off fear, right? Fair exchange ain't robbery, though. Mm, robbery. Greatness. Yo, we got to say hi to Heidi Jackson. Peace, family. What's um, up, Heidi Jackson? What's up? Uh, Sharon, thank you for sharing your wisdom and lived experience with this group. Um, she has a scenario for us. Imagine that this cohort is creating a strategic plan for reparations to black artists, arts and artists. What would you recommend be included as action items? Mm. Mm. Oh. <laughs> For, for me, I'm going to just say this. For me, that's hard to really answer because we haven't come together and had the conversation ourselves. Like, what are we looking for? Do we want more stages? Do we want more opportunities for money? Do we want to build um, buildings in our neighborhoods? Do we want to make sure? I mean, what are we looking for when we talk about reparations? Because that's to right repair something that is damaged. So what are we looking for in Seattle? And I think that would, that's a great question. But I also would like to see uh, that that community that we're talking about get together and have a plan. So when we go to people and we ask them or tell them what it is that we need, it's something that speaks communitively and not just individually. Because individually, I might just want money. Somebody else might want something totally different. And But together, those two things may make sense for all of us. And so how do we figure that out? And I think first, we need to have a conversation as black arts and artists in Seattle, those that are willing, be honest and share with each other. Don't go in there as a hating session, a beefing session, time to flex on each other, but really find out what are we coming up with? What's our plan? What is our plan? And then whatever we're willing to share, like you said, Sharon, like has been stated on this, this conversation, and then we'll share with you what we want to share with you. But, you know, maybe everything, we don't need to tell you everything. So I would like to see the black artists and art community come together and have a conversation before we go out publicly and start demanding things in the name of blackness. Mm. Right. I think, I, think, I think no one person can speak for what black arts or artists need, but I do see, uh, I, I have a question for Seattle Center over, over everything. And that's um, before you start to get into work like this, like look into like the organizations that's a part of the Seattle Center campus. Yeah, y'all do Festal and things of that nature, what brings in all these different um, BIPOC organizations and cultures and things of that nature. But when you look at the footprint for Seattle Center and you look at the organizations, I, I, don't, I don't see BIPOC missions or visions and, or values or things of that nature within the campus. So I think there's some, some work to be done for Seattle Center, period. And... Um, and in and, and, and the offerings of the entire campus. Um, and speaking of somebody on campus, I love you, Reese. Um, uh, I always love hearing from you. Reese says, thank you so much for taking the time to share with us. For each of you, if you were to look into the future, a year or three years from now, what is one or more thing that you would see that would make you feel like the work is being done? 
what change would be impactful? Thank you, Reese. Let's start with Maysia. Yes, I think that, uh, I think you guys kind of talked about this earlier, intersections. There's no perfect package that comes for one black artist that's going to be uh, a beneficial reparation. There's going to be, you know, different neighborhoods that different that black artists come from. There's going to be um, different art that black artists do. So I think that once they start actually acknowledging intersections and that there's no uh, monolith of black identity, there's no single spectrum of black identity. I think that's when I'll actually feel like okay, you're value, valuing the different black identities, the different black lives that exist. I don't know all the answers of, of how that can be done, but I know that um, it starts with resources, like I've been saying, the resources that they're putting into communities, whether that be grants, uh, whether that be the positions that they're letting these black artists take in organizations, you have to be willing to uh, allow the voices in there because without the voices, there's no change. So the intersections is the most important thing that would have to be done. Oh, nah. Hmm. Repeat the question again. <laughs> I know that's right. <laughs> <laughs> if you were to look into the future a year or three years from now, mm -hmm. what is one or more things that you would see that would make you feel like the work is being done? What change would be impactful? Hmm. I... I feel, I mean, yeah, I think what was said before um, when Lasia said resources, and, and, and then also in my mind, I'm like, well, what else? Because we're always asking about, we're always saying resources, resources, resources. And, you know, we get, a, we, we get some resources here and there, and then we're still asking for more resources. So it's almost like, Instead of going to the farmer, be the create the farm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like I that's I feel like the the there will be a bigger impact when I like I have to agree with Jace when when we as an organization can um not not we as an organization as we as a people can come together and 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 we're not all going to come together i know that but i know but a good amount of us that can come together and and say like okay these are the things and 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 these are the things and there's multitude of things because we're not monolithic so there's multiple things that that we that we are looking for and if we need the help we'll 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 bring it in you know we'll we'll connect and will collaborate with other people but i can only i can only think about myself like mm -hmm. i need mm -hmm. i need my family to 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 be able to have more space to create more you know what i'm saying like what does it look like to have a studio space to really like create the work that we need to create and and then what does it look like to so there's there's so many there's so many questions and there's so many things that because as an artist you're only working with so much that to expand you're looking to expand and even your expansion might be small mm -hmm. so it's just like what does it look like to have freedom to expand in in that is away from the glass ceiling mm -hmm. And I think that is the thing. And I don't know what that looks like on this material world, on that physicality, because that's something that I, that question that, that is being asked, I may not see it fully in my lifetime, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I can, I can, I can venture for it. I can, I can not just talk about it, but I can make actions toward it, towards it. So the next generation can, 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 can continue on and see something better. So I don't have a stamped approval of what it looks like. I just know 
that it has to be more than just asking for the resources. There is something more to it. And I don't know what that more is for all of us or for me specifically. But I know there's something that I've said to myself since I was young. There is something more than this. I said that at a young age, there is something more than this. I don't know what it is. And I'm 33 and I'm saying the same thing. And I'm going to continue to say it. And I'm going to continue to look for it. And I'm going to continue to grab what I can see that can be in connection to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with you on the resource thing because if you, that's why I said I'm still processing this because even when you think about it, like affirmative action was, um, was brought up as a resource. And we've seen that even in that, it has racist framework um, with the definition of that. So it's like, how are we defining things? What's the framework that we're working around? And that's something that I'm still trying to figure out at 22. So I guess I'll still be trying to figure it out for a while. Why is all of us in double num- why, why numbers? 22, 33, 44. Um, Jace, bring us home. What are your I, thoughts I, about I don't, I don't know. As you know, I don't know if you call me because I'm the oldest, the last. But, you know, I respect it. You know, beauty before age. I'm with it. Um, but, you know, the, the other thing on the real side is like I'm just listening. Because what was said was right on time. I like the fertile ground, fertile soil, so we can build and grow our own food. So we're feeding the people healthy. We're not feeding them something that they got to go to a store to get. This is something that's in your backyard. It's in your community. It becomes communitive. We can share with our neighbors. We can exchange with our neighbors, right? We're all not, all black folks, we're not monolithic. We all don't think the same. We all don't need the same things. But you know, to, to, to figure out what it is that we need, like, I, like they said, it's bigger than just saying resources. I think it starts with valuing yourself and your people and the community you come from and the family that taught you and honoring those messages and those, those experiences and sharing them the way that reflects value and strength and pride. I believe that, you know, the question was answered and I, I really believe the question was answered because I think that, you know, trying to like, Oh, I got the answer is where we go wrong. It's like, I got a contribution, you know, it's that gumbo. I got, I got the, I got the prawns. You got the chicken. All right. Who's bringing, who's bringing the, who's going to do the rule. You know what I'm saying? Who's bringing the sausage? Cause we're going to eat, we're going to eat together. And so I just believe that the way we, we get to where we're going is we allow everybody to add a little bit to that recipe to make it really good food. And to make good food, we got to start from what it is that we have inside of us and what it is that we have a taste for. Mm -hmm. And as black folks in this country, in this city, what do we have a taste for? What do we want to see really happen? Like Mm -hmm. after this is over, do we just want to say, man, we had 35 panels and, you know, we did 10 uh, black, uh, uh, said black events and we're good or do we say okay we hold back on some panels we hold back on some events to get ourselves together mm-hmm. so when time comes back in time and they look back at it they say you know what they took this time oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I get to read and chat they took this time to really really figure out What's going to be the best thing moving forward for the next generation? Because Nas right. It's about the next generation. Our ancestors had this fight, too. And I heard somebody say this. We better get brave like our ancestors because this is our time to fight now. This is our time to sacrifice. And regardless of how we feel in 2020, it will be here in 2050 and 2070 if we don't make the changes necessary starting with us. So... I mean, that would be my contribution to echo what Na and Lasia said. And I just want to say this, Lasia, you're a beautiful young lady. And I'm proud to be your dad. So. <laughs> Thank uh, you, Dad. Sorry, I was muted. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I think that's one of the best ways to, to end this conversation. Um, and I just want to thank all the panelists for for bringing your true selves in a conversation and being willing to share. I know that um, in being black, having these type of conversations 
um, we relive trauma often and bringing, and we, we give, give, give. And I just want to let you know that I appreciate that you decided to give today. Um, and I know that was based off your relationship with um, Alina. And so Alina, thank you for having us here um, and bringing us together. Um, and also for Seattle Center Campus, you, you, you have a treasure in, in, in what is happening here right now in this conversation, because this was food for thought. This was us just, just giving, you, giving of ourselves, of you. So we hope that you don't let the conversation end here. Um, take what you've learned today. Go back to your groups and have conversation. Take it home with you and say, I heard this today. Let's talk about this. When the video is available, watch it. Listen, talk about it. The only way that we educate ourselves is by, is by actually giving into the process. So we appreciate y'all for hanging out with us today. Um, and, and we wish you the best and being the change agents um, that you can be for not just for your organization, for your family and for the community. Um, Black Lives Matter. Um, every day. Every day. Every day. Not just right. this That's conversation. Right. Much appreciation. One love, Sharon. Great job. Good love love y'all. You. Ah, can't wait to hug y'all. <laughs> yeah. One day soon. One day soon. Exactly. Peace, nah. Thank you. Peace. Peace Super. and blessings. Thank you. Super dope. Lena, are you jumping back in? Here, here I am. Where okay, am I? cool. Thank you all so, so much. Um, I, I don't have anything to add. I, well, what am I going to say? That was all wonderful, and I have such deep appreciation and love for for each of you, um, and just just deep gratitude. Thank you for sharing of yourselves and uh, just your brilliance and your wisdom and patience, and I appreciate and love each of you. Um, we will get together soon yeah even if it's a zoom dinner <laughs> we'll do zoom hug. we gotta learn how to do zoom hugs zoom, hug. zoom high fives like <laughs> if, you, if you hit the box to get to, to so, yep so we do so it's like boom oh. yeah there you go oh, <laughs> oh my I god learn that with my kids <laughs> When, uh, I, when I've been teaching them online, I've, I've been like, all right, we're going to do a high five now. Come on, hit the box, hit the box, hit the box. <laughs> so, okay. yeah. uh, Peter, you got to say goodbye to your audience. <laughs> all right, all right. Bye, audience. We'll, uh, we'll talk later. I, there's a debrief uh, calendar for, for the five of us. So, All right, everyone, take care. Love you. Thank you. Thank you all. Peace. Peace. Peace.